Welcome to Yimby Nation, a podcast exploring U.S. housing and the roadblocks to building more equitable neighborhoods. Join Jimmy, Peter, and V as they, and special guests, offer their unique perspectives on building more diverse communities and addressing the social problems that emanate from the lack of decent, safe, and affordable housing. Our hosts have served in the fields of advocacy and nonprofit, public and private development, and are driven by their passion for community empowerment. Join the conversation and share your thoughts on social using hashtag Yimby Nation. Welcome to Yembe Nation podcast. We are very excited today to have with us Fred McKinney. I have known Fred McKinney since I was in college. Dr. Fred has been a guiding force for me and waste management since the beginning. He has been a mentor, a dear friend, and a great advocate for waste. But enough about me. <laughs> Dr. Fred received his PhD in economics from Yale University in 1983. He has taught and worked at Sacred Heart University, Brandeis University, the University of Connecticut School of Business, and Duff Malk Tuck School of Business. Additionally, Dr. Fred served as the president and CEO of the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council. Dr. Fred is the co-founder of the economic consulting firm called BJM Solutions. He lives in Trumbull, Connecticut with his wife, Ivy, and two dogs, Rory and Bentley. The McKinney's also have two adult children and two grandsons. Jimmy, Peter, and myself are very excited to have a chat with you today. So welcome, Fred. Welcome, Thank Dr. Fred. Thank you. Thank you. It's glad, I'm glad to be here with you. Same here, Dr. Fred. Good to see all of you. Um, I'm honored to be uh, talking to a person who's known by one name, Dr. Fred. You know, <laughs> this, anytime you have one name like Michael or Magic, then you, you must be famous. So I'm honored, Dr. Fred. So anyway, so, you know, I... Recently, I uh, was reading a study from a Harvard uh, researcher saying that uh, half the uh, renters in the country pay more than 30% of their income for rent. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, from being in economies, that's, that's called a housing burden. And um, when our first uh, podcast we had on Dr. Karen DeBoer Walton, who's the uh, president of the Elm City community, and she talked about all the um, rent disparities in, the, in Connecticut and uh, the possibility of all the families being evicted because of COVID. Uh, and then just recently I ran into a friend of mine and uh, her rent had gone up by um, $300 a month. And then I ran into another friend of mine, our rent had gone up from a thousand to almost $2,000 uh, a month. So, and that's disheartening to uh, someone like me who's been in the housing field for 45 years, right? And I don't know what, what the individual is supposed, supposed to do. So mm -hmm. as, as, as an economist, I mean, what insight can you shed on uh, the impact of rising rents on housing disparities, as well as on uh, racial equality as, as well, particularly among low-income people of color? Well, th thank you, Jimmy. And uh, my, my one name, I tell my wife all the time, I'm, I'm a D, I'm a D list celebrity. So I've got a whole bunch of other people. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we do, unfortunately, in this country, it's not just in Connecticut, in this country as a whole, have a have a housing crisis. Uh, and the crisis is is most uh, it's, it's affecting lower and moderate income Americans the most. And, uh, and it's, it's actually gotten worse in recent months. And it's, uh, it's because of a number of factors. So as an economist, I kind of look at, okay, why are rents going up? Uh, why is the supply of lower income or, or lower cost housing uh, or affordable housing uh, in such a crisis. 
And, you know, there obviously the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on the housing market uh, throughout the country. And, you know, it had several, several things. And these things are all related. The, the rental market is related to the home ownership market. And, and so during the pandemic, uh, you had not only renters looking to um, move into more spacious surroundings. Uh, and so initially you had, uh, in particularly in the bigger cities, um, people moving out of rental units, trying to buy uh, owner home, becoming homeowners when they could. And that created uh, an increased demand for home ownership. And in Connecticut, we saw the effect of that with housing prices in Connecticut just skyrocketing in the early phases of the pandemic. And the, the, the other, the flip side of that though, was as people were leaving apartments, uh, the, the, the prices on, on rentals were, were more or less stable. Plus you had sort of the pandemic uh, intervention by state, local and the federal government that uh, allowed renters to essentially uh, not pay their rent and be and suffer the consequences of what happens in normal markets. So it made it very difficult for landlords to, um, to kick anybody out of a, a rental unit. Now, so you had this pandemic effect. Now on top of this pandemic effect, you have this economic situation with inflation, which was also related to the pandemic. So we had this supply chain crisis uh, that affected just about all markets, uh, from automotive to computers to, to housing. And so with the rising prices that came about because of inflation, because of the uh, pandemic, and also the war in Ukraine, all these things are, you, are related. You had the Federal Reserve step in, and what they did is they started raising interest rates. And so as the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates, the effect of that was to make uh, housing markets cool off. And so, uh, so the housing, the ownership, home ownership markets have slowed down in recent months because of the, the Federal Reserve's increase in interest rates. Now, what that's done though, on the flip side again, is it's, it's put people into the rental market, which is driving up rents. And so you've seen a number, I've seen a number of articles talking about rents in a number of markets where rents are now becoming unaffordable because people can't afford to buy a house because of the interest rates and, and now they're renting. And so the demand for rentals is higher. Now the pandemic had this other effect. Those are all kind of demand effects. The supply effect of the pandemic was the construction industry pretty much slow, came to a halt. On, on the building of affordable housing and not even non-affordable housing. And so, you know, I, I was thinking about this before the call and we, we in this country have what I would call a hand-me-down housing market. And so, you know, if, we, if you look at urban centers, the houses that are, uh, are affordable now were once, you know, nice, really nice, houses in fact they could have be called sort of higher income luxury houses and you know i'm familiar with a number of communities across the state but i'm thinking like in bridgeport or in new haven you've got these really beautiful homes in in inner city neighborhoods that were once you know mansions single family homes that have since been divided up into multiple rental units and you've got landlords who own these properties now who quite frankly haven't been taking care of them and but they're charging more in rent and so you know we've got this crisis of supply not enough affordable housing is being built and on top of that you've got this crisis of demand where uh, people have, are beginning now to slow down the, the home ownership market and move back into the rental market and that's driving up rents. Uh, I mean, rents have been increasing uh, double digit for the past uh, three or four months. Coming at this from uh, another angle, Dr. Fred, as an economist in the uh, research and readings that you do, 
what role do you see affordable housing playing in creating social and economic stability and security for low and moderate income households? How important is housing oh, it's, to the stability it's, of these families? It, it's critical. I mean, at, at the end of the day, everybody sleeps someplace. But that someplace can be uh, in a car, it could be in a street, it can be in a dilapidated house, or it could be in a house that is safe, is secure, and provides the environment for a healthy uh, family or a healthy individual to live. And, and so housing really is a, is a, is a foundational uh, item in any households. You notice we call them households in any mm -hmm. household's existence. And so as Jimmy mentioned, you know, if, when, if you're spending, uh, you know, too high a percentage on your, on your rent, um, that means there's less for everything else. And so uh, it, it, if you can't, if you're spending over, you know, typically we try to keep rents below 30% of your, of your total income. But as, it, as that goes up, as that percentage goes up, that means there's less for transportation, there's less for food, there's less for just maintenance of the household. And so that, that is your big, that's most people's largest expense is their living expense, their household expense. Then you throw on top of that utilities, et cetera. And if that rate, if that percentage gets to be too high, then you're gonna be stressed. And so you put on top of the financial stress, you got the stress of living in substandard housing. I, I noticed just this week, there was a case that was, two cases that were reported in New Haven about landlords who've been brought to court because they have not maintained their their properties, which are essentially affordable housing, but you know these folks are living in houses that have uh, rats and roaches and broken windows and peeling paint and fixtures coming off the wall, and that's no place to live in America in 2022. It doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, if you if you're living in that condition, uh, what does that say to the, you know, particularly the children that are that are forced to live in these types of conditions? Yeah, and to that point, what are the social benefits that having stable housing has for family and children, uh, particularly in regards to mental health and education? Absolutely. I mean, so, you know, the way that we, we structure our educational system, I'll take education first, is that you, we have neighborhood schools for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so there's an assumption that you live in that neighborhood. We've got, you know, at this point, well over a million people in this country that are homeless, and those include awesome. children. Um, right. And so they are, you know, they're not rooted in the community where they live and where they go to school. And, and so you think about the pressure, the psychological effect that homelessness or real, really ill housed people have, what that effect has on, on their sense of self. And cause they're looking around at others that, that literally go home after school. Uh, and for, for too many people, that home is either substandard or it it is in a in a it does not exist. And so it that creates all kinds of stress on the household, on those children, on the mothers and fathers who are trying to do what they can to change those conditions. And so it does create all kinds of mental health issues uh, by not having the stability of a home. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Um, I want to touch base on that a bit because you know when I think about let's say New Haven, for example, New Haven is mm -hmm. is is a town where you know you, you look at downtown. I recently came across an organization which is the, the soup kitchen, and they are housing more than 30 people every day, feeding them, not housing, yeah. but rather feeding them. And this is right downtown of New Haven. You know, mm -hmm. 
So you have like the, the gap between you know, the, 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 the rich and the very you know, poor. I don't even have uh, a meal to eat every single day. And you wonder, um, based on everything that we just discussed, can you, can you share maybe possibly what could be a short-term solution and a long-term solution toward the right direction where um, this is concerned? Yeah, I mean, there, there have been many studies on the causes of uh, housing insecurity and homelessness. Um, and um, I've actually studied this uh, in a class that I was teaching on social entrepreneurship uh, when I was at Quinnipiac University. Um, and we had the students, you know, looking at the causes of homelessness in big and small communities and also housing insecurity. And, you know, there, there are many sort of um, descriptors, if you will. I don't want to call them causes because I think it gets deeper than just these descriptors. But what we see is that there are several factors, in, and you mentioned them. One is mental health. So you see people that, um, that are suffering from homelessness and being ill housed also have a higher percentage of mental health issues. But the question is, did the mental health start first or did the, did the homelessness start first? Right. And, you know, and I think it probably goes towards you know, housing insecurity causes mental health issues as opposed to mental health issues causes, they, they both cause you know, the other. But I think if you ask, well, what, what happened first? Uh, you know, it's not quite a chicken and egg problem, but I do think that the, the homelessness, the housing insecurity is a factor in people's mental health and, and, and stability. So related to that, obviously, is uh, to pay for housing, you have to have a source of income or you have to have a source of support. And so we often find that, you know, Americans are not as financially secure as as they may think they are and so you know it's the old saying that most most americans unfortunately are maybe three paychecks away from being kicked out of their their place their abode and, and so you know if you miss three months of, of pay you know you're in trouble uh and you know there have been plenty of studies the federal reserve did a study that talked about the amount of savings that people have you know, people's savings are a source of some financial security. And they found that, uh, you know, I think it was over 30% of Americans didn't have enough in savings to fix a broken car. And so that's a problem that if you don't have that kind of support, uh, that kind of personal support that puts you, makes you more vulnerable. And, and so in terms of short-term solutions, I think the short-term solutions, you deal with the symptoms. The short-term solutions are you feed people, you house people. Um, you don't concern yourself with how they got there, why they're there. You support them, you know, and to use a, 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 another term, you love them, you, you support them. Uh, and that's what you do as a, as, a, as, a, as a progressive society that I think America would like to be in many cases. So I think that's a short-term solution. A longer-term solution, you got to really get at the root causes of this dilemma. And the root causes of this dilemma have to do with how we structure our society to, um, to, to pay people, to how do people live? You know, I, I'm fortunate, many of us are fortunate probably here. We were either, we took some initiative, we did some things, we got lucky. Uh, we, we, we're supporting ourselves and, and we may have some savings, but uh, that's, you know, we kind of think of that every look at our own experiences when we had some kinds of quote success and we, we say, we typically say, well, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Well, anybody, everybody doesn't do it. So you have to ask yourself, well, what is it about modern American society that leads to so much uh, stress and tension when it comes to housing and economic insecurity. And, uh, you know, this, this, this it's, a, it's a pretty cold world out there. <laughs> if, you, if, you don't, if you don't go out and get a job and, and, and make some money, then you're in trouble. And yeah. if you throw on top of that, you, you don't have a home to call a base, uh, you're gonna be even further trouble. 
Um, and uh, and so I, I think the long term solutions are are are, are very difficult uh, in nature. They they really speak to the issue of what kind of society do we want to have, and and are we are we comfortable with a modern capitalist uh, uh, economy that essentially um, uh, does not include so many people. Uh, in, and so that they can take care of themselves, and you know, the, the, this has been a this has been a long debate um, in American society and, and in Western society about you know uh, what do you do with the poor people, <laughs> and so and why are they poor, um, and so you know the you know going back to the the early progressive movement in American society, you had writers like Jacob Reed. <laughs> who wrote a book called How the Other Half Lives. And in that book, you know, he was, he was a writer or journalist and he basically was look, documenting how people were living in New York City uh, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And it didn't, and it was the other half, it was 50%. And then if you move forward to um, uh, Roosevelt, you know, he talked about how a third of Americans are ill-fed, ill-housed, and ill-clothed, a third. And so, you know, if you compare Jacob Reese's 19th century America, where half the people were living in poverty and were ill-housed, to Franklin Roosevelt's 33% of the people suffering similar situations, to today, you know, significantly less than 33%, but we still have this problem of too many Americans uh, living in poverty, uh, being ill-housed, uh, being uh, unable to, uh, to have the resources to feed themselves. So something is wrong uh, with society, I think, and with the economy and how we're structured that uh, does not effectively deal with this problem. It's a it's a tough problem. Mm. That's that's really good, and it makes a lot of sense. Which is actually bringing me to my next um, question. And so we talk about how do we, what is a short term solution and what is a long term solution. I think you did a great job um, putting it into perspective, even though it's not easy. Um, you know, we think also on the other side about you know the businesses. How you grow a business so that especially small and minority businesses, because when you grow small and minority businesses, mm -hmm. there's a high percentage of chances that they also go and hire at a small minority businesses. Mm -hmm. but how do you get that? Um, and that brings me to two of my questions. Now, the first one I have is, um, it's in a recent article in the CT Insider, where you spoke about um, a golden opportunity to transform Connecticut black and brown businesses. And this also relates to that passage of the $1.2 trillion of um, hard infrastructure bill to create sustainable jobs. Um, and that is for businesses and communities to, that have been underserved for decades. Mm -hmm. Now, I have um, this question and then a follow-up question. So the first question is, how do small businesses benefit without the pieces of equipment and the resources to capture um, this great market coming? Because it's easy for somebody to say, well, if all these big companies can do it, you can do it too as a smaller company. And it's not always the case because not everybody you know, has the, uh, the capital to purchase these equipment or have it inherited to get in and start going. Right. So how do these small businesses benefit from these pieces of equipment or the pieces of opportunity that's coming up as part of the market search? Well, a great question. And, you know, th there is a tremendous opportunity with the investment in, and infrastructure that's uh, on the books, on, that's in the plans. And, you know, if, again, I go back to history. If you look at the interstate highway system, most black and brown communities in the country really were the victims of the interstate highway construction. Uh, they, 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 put those highways that divided inner cities and they became permanently divided. Uh, they often took out the commercial viability of, of communities that prior to the interstate uh, were viable economic centers. Um, and on top of that, they 
the the black and brown business community didn't get any work from that that investment in uh, in infrastructure. And so I think today what we're trying to do or what I think should be done is that the federal government and they seem like they're making a commitment um, of of making sure that uh, minority businesses have a role to play, a significant role to play in this infrastructure investment. Um, because let's face it, um, you know, in this country, we, we have kind of the myth of success and how you got it. And then there's the reality of success and how you got it. And uh, again, I, there are plenty of examples in history, but I think an example here is also on point. And so, you know, when the, when the country, uh, when the United States government decided that it was going to essentially move west, you know, and, and take land away from indigenous peoples, uh, they basically gave it away. Um, and they, they gave it away to, to white Americans who paid almost nothing for the land in essentially west of the Mississippi River uh, or was settled by Americans who, white Americans who just went there and for literally next to nothing got 160 acres or more in land and set up their businesses, their farms and their communities. And, and so, you know, that those, those is ironic that many of the folks in those same communities are against government intervention to assist poor people and brown people and black people, uh, even though they were the beneficiaries of this largesse from the federal government. And so I think when we look at infrastructure today and infrastructure investment, we really have to push, these, our communities have to push the federal government to make sure that those small businesses that don't have the capital right now get the capital that don't have the support, get the support, that are, are you know, because these, these investments are gonna be made in our communities again. Mm -hmm. and, and so it makes perfect sense that the businesses in our communities participate in the development of our communities. That's how you create uh, businesses and how you create generational wealth. And I, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely correct, 110% correct. Um, on another question that is um, somehow relating, um, which is also, I love the articles, by the way, you, <laughs> I love all the articles that I read. Um, this second question came in mind when I read some of your articles. Um, this one was particularly titled, um, many companies posing as minority owned um, through France companies. Right. And so the, the idea is that there's opportunities for minorities and women-owned businesses in the industry, um, in all the industries. And these are set of sites that are been designated for um, certified, uh, let's say legitimate uh, minority and women-owned businesses. However, um, there are, let's say white companies that have, let's say um, their wives that are being made as the front so mm -hmm. that they can acquire the work. Right. right. Um, and that's coming from in, uh, very often the, 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 the bigger companies. Mm -hmm. So we've read these articles um, time and time again with different companies getting in trouble and they get a little bit of a pat in their back right. and they go back and they do it again. But you covered that more than um, a, a quarter of, of the um, re reports saying that um, the corporate and federal spending with minority and women owned businesses is being channeled through companies run by white men and large public companies, um, you know, which I understand and I've seen that also myself. However, um, I don't wanna make the assumptions uh, because you are the economist. So can you elaborate on that for us? Tell us why this sure. is so. Yeah, and, and again, I, I, had, um, I, have a, I had a corporate client of mine contact me and said they wanted me to look at a, tra a potential transaction to see what I thought about it. And because they had some reservations about whether or not uh, this transaction involved a, a, a front, a company that said they were minority, uh, but really were, were not. And so I, they gave me the information. I looked at it and I told them that they were right to be concerned about this transaction and that I thought that the company was um, not a legitimate minority company. 
And so I published, I published a, an, a short article in that corporation's newsletter with the co-author being the, the chief procurement officer of that large company. And that article got seen by several people around the country and uh, two, M two MBEs contacted me independently and said, hey, we saw your article. We got the same problem in our industry. And these were two different industries, two different MBEs, didn't know each other. And so I said, hmm, let's, let's do a study. And so my study, I looked at, I, 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 I surveyed supplier diversity professionals in large corporations. And I asked them, I defined what a, what a, what a pass-through is, and I asked them, what percentage do you think of pass-throughs are representing minority, uh, so-called minority businesses? And they reported out that about 28% of corporate contracts, contracts, transactions are with uh, uh, minor, what I call minority front organizations. And you know the, there are some distinguishing characteristics of these organizations. Uh, one, they they basically have to have a willing minority or woman-owned partner who is willing to accept uh, essentially a pittance for receiving a receiving an administrative fee, really, to to execute these these transactions. But most of that business goes to a non-minority company. And it can be a large company, a public company, uh, but the public company is using that minority, a woman-owned firm to, to bill a customer or the government for some products. The customer pays the minority, a woman-owned firm. The minority-owned firm, again, just transfers most of the money to their non-minority partner, if you will, and the non-minority partner delivers the products and services to the customer. And so the, that's why the term pass-through. So the money is passing through that front organization, and the products and services are passing through, but nothing sticks. And so what happens as a result of that, you don't get any economic development of communities because there's nothing there except a small check that goes into the pocket of the, of the, of the minority or woman-owned collaborator. So this is a problem. And I, I think, you know, I, I suggest several solutions. One of them is the, there are organizations that certify these organizations. They have to do a better job at policing these types of transactions and these types of companies. Uh, and the companies themselves have to do a better job uh, of understanding who they're doing business with. And so, you know, it's, um, uh, it, 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 takes many, it takes many forms, <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, it really has a pernicious effect on legitimate minority businesses. My business is hard enough as it is. Uh, for particularly for minority and women owned business, legitimate minority and women owned businesses. And so to lose that kind of business to these front organizations is not a good thing. And it's not the reason why these programs began in the first place. So they really are in conflict with the intent of programs that are designed to, to build minority businesses and minority communities. Yeah, because I think that is, is so critical that, um, especially with the infrastructure and all of the other opportunities mm -hmm. that are coming up, um, a system or a, a more thorough look at what is going on so that those that are, let's say, um, small minority business that want to grow have a legitimate opportunity to participate and actually grow their business right. um, versus, you know, having to do, uh, let's say, a paper push from not even in the same town right. or in, in the same state. Because every time that happens, that means um, one more legitimate minority uh, woman on business is going to lose that opportunity right. because it went to someone else. I can also, I can't help but wonder, because it's it's just such a bigger problem than um, it seems, and I don't think we can solve it today. But do you think, and I, I'm going to assume that it's a combination of greed, there's also a combination of the pressure, right? So there's the pressure of um, you yep. have to meet the goals no matter what. Right. And the majority company um, or the prime company is saying, well, I you're not giving me enough time to figure out who's good or who's not. And I have my bonding on the line and I want to get the right person. And 
so there are legitimate times where you, you, you just can't find a qualified company, but there are often legitimate times that you can't find, but you know, you just don't want to use them, right. uh, which prevents that growth of the intention of that set aside. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a, a, there's a, there's a solution, uh, but I think, uh, uh, and you probably have witnessed many minority businesses, uh, women owned businesses that have gone through this uh, right. one way or the other. Yeah. So it's interesting because we have, trillions of dollars coming up in the pipeline and this is going back to history where that opportunity was there but was lost on so many 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 um businesses or smaller um, entities that could have grown otherwise so we we don't want that to happen again this time around what advice would you give the certifying companies what advice would you give the 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 bigger companies what advice would you give the government agencies and finally what advice would you give the people that are just doing it? I mean, that's right. just stop it. <laughs> but right. what is the simplest way? Right. Well, in terms of the uh, larger companies that are uh, the customers, uh, I, I think that they have to, to have uh, really a better understanding of why uh, supplier diversity and minority and women business development are, are, are exist in the first place. Um, you know, as much as we want to see wealth generated uh, in communities, uh, we also want to see those communities become wealthier. Um, and the problem with pass-throughs uh, is that they don't generate any community wealth because there's no value that sticks in that community. Uh, it all goes to uh, um, a, essentially a large firm that is most, in most cases, not even uh, physically located in, in diverse communities, uh, may not even have a whole bunch of diverse people running the company uh, or working in the company. So um, that is, that's not good. So those companies that are buying from these organizations have to understand that it's wrong. Now, government has, um, you know, in the states and, and the federal government, it's against the law. It's not just wrong. Uh, if you are, you know, there, there are certain things that you stipulate if you're doing business with the federal government or with the state government that's using federal funds. And that's where you've had a number of companies get into trouble where they've created these minority fronts and, um, and tried to benefit from them and they got found out. And so I think part of the solution here is you have to police these transactions better. It's easier to do on public contracts uh, than it is on private contracts. Um, But I think it also means that uh, we need more whistleblowers, quite frankly. Uh, If if, uh, minority entrepreneurs, legitimate minority entrepreneurs see something that they don't think is is right, they they should alert the authorities that, hey, there's something not right here. Uh, This this business is, is literally taking business away from legitimate companies. So uh, minority businesses, the legitimate minority businesses need to uh, be eyes and ears in this space to help police it. The the federal and state governments need to have the resources to police it and want to police it. And the corporations that are participating in it need to be educated as to say, hey, this is not good. And if you get, you know, if, if, if it's found out that you're doing these types of practices, it's, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be front page articles that you're not going to want to see. So we've got to use that as a, a, a factor to, uh, or a, 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 a tool to get them to stop. So I, I think those are the types of things that, that you have to do. And, you know, the companies that the minority entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs who are benefiting from this are, you know, participating in, in a scam. And, you know, they should realize that that's not a sustainable um, situation. And uh, sooner or later, they're going to, you know, they're going to probably uh, have to pay for their behavior. Thanks for joining us and listening to today's episode of Yimby Nation. Continue the conversation in your communities and on social using hashtag Yimby Nation. Connect with V at www.vaceconstruction.com. Connect with Jimmy at www.sincereconsulting.com. 
and connect with Peter by searching Collaborative Development Consulting on LinkedIn.com. Please leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform so we can continue helping communities thrive. Email us at contact at yimbynation.com or visit the podcast website at www.yimbynation.com. Until next time. Join us in two weeks for part two with Dr. Fred McKinney.